so last time we were talking about derangements. And so what is a derangement? A derangement is a permutation with what? What's this particular property of a derangement? Yeah, no, none of the values are in their natural starting position, right? So we have a, a, a sequence that's in a particular order, and then we permute that. And so when we sometimes say this is a permutation with no fixed points. And what does that mean? That just means that everything has been moved out of whatever position it, it started in. Um, so our task last time uh, that we left with was let's count these things, right? Let's count the number of derangements of n items. Excuse me. So we have uh, we, we started by actually listing things, right? If we said we said if there's um, one item, how many derangements there's one item, there are no derangements. We said that as kind of a, a default. If you had zero items, we say one derangement just because there's nothing to do, kind of like um, zero factorial is one because there's nothing to do in that situation. Uh, with two items, how many derangements were there? One. One. With three items? There were two. And we left off with four items and there being nine derangements. All right, so what happens? Nine of the 24 possible permutations were derangements. All of the others left at least one thing in whatever order things started in. Okay, um, so again, what we're assuming here in this situation is that there is some kind of natural order to whatever things we're talking about. So we had numbers. Uh, or if we had letters, there's alphabetical order. If we have other things, there's some kind of ordering. If there's not a kind of ordering to it, um, then we don't really talk about things being out of order, right? So, um, so we do have some kind of, of natural way to, uh, or maybe not natural, right? Just some kind of way that we have decided that here's the order of things. All right, so we left off with then trying to continue this and find out how many derangements there are for um, other values of n. Several people sent me values and said, is this the right for this? Is this right for that? Um, so what happens? How many derangements are there for, for five items? 44? Okay, so what did you do to get that value? Did we create all the permutations and just count them? So, okay, so one approach to doing this we could We could 
just create all possible permutations of n elements and count the derangements. We could do that by hand, except that number gets really big in a hurry, so we would definitely want to write a program to do that. So what's the pro of that approach? Or pros, I guess, right? What are the, what are the good things about that approach? You can see every permutation. You can check the results and say, yes, this is a this is a derangement. Oh, wait a minute, this is not a derangement. We could actually count everything. What do we have to make sure that our program does? That it actually creates all possible permutations? Right? And so what happens making sure that we have created all possible permutations? If we don't know how to do that, it can be a struggle, right? We have to figure out how to create all possible permutations. What about counting derangements then? Checking to see whether something is a derangement. How difficult is that? Right? Right? We can check a value against an index or something, right? If they match up, it's not a derangement. If they don't match, if none of them match, then it is a derangement, right? So, so that part is easy if we can create all possible permutations. But then still what happens, even if we figure out how to create all possible permutations, what happens as n gets big? There become a lot of, a lot of permutations, right? So even if we do this, this is only going to be able to give us the answers for particular values of n that aren't too big. Now what is too big? Well, that depends. Um, but eventually creating all possible permutations and trying to store all of them would be a memory issue. Or a, a, But what happens if we have, even if we don't store all of them, it still becomes a time issue because n factorial gets to be pretty big. Except what can we do? We could rule out some possible permutations and not consider those. What permutations do we not have to consider? Right, ones where the value for sure is in its like. For instance, if we start, um, if we're just looking at the items one through n, and so we imagine we're indexing one through n, we don't need to consider anything that starts with a one. Right, so we can improve on that and not have to consider all of the permutations, but we have to make sure that if we're leaving some out, that we're not accidentally leaving out some that include derangements. Make sure that we include everything that could possibly be a derangement. Okay, so um, so that's one approach. Another approach uh, might be to get some data, compare for small things, where we can actually maybe utilize this, and see if there are any patterns to it. See if there are any patterns to the numbers. Or completely do this from a mathematical approach and utilize, say, inclusion-exclusion that we talked about last time to see if there's a way... Um, Got to be a reason we talked about inclusion, exclusion, and then immediately started talking about derangements, right? So, um, so utilizing a mathematical approach to come up with an answer. So lots of different ways. One that's purely uh, calculation-based. One that would be using that data uh, in some way to try to find a pattern to it and then be able to hopefully prove the pattern. Or a couple of different mathematical approaches that we will, that we'll look at. So we'll, we'll do all of those conceivably, uh, at least at least conceptually work through, uh, and the mathematical ones we'll do in more in more detail. So you changed your approach, you said. You started this way. What did you change to? What did you do? I'm sorry? Inclusion. Okay, so you did. You used the inclusion, exclusion. I, I was sort of trying to figure out an equation for it, and I saw that there were a lot of different combinations, and depending on if something got chosen before the problem and stuff, okay. and I sort of realized, hey, this is Okay, so by trying to improve on this, you realize that there's this connection to the other approach, and so you're able to um, maybe come up with a formula that does the counting without having to list everything. The nice thing about a formula that does the counting is if we need to list everything, if we, you know, if we can prove that this formula works. Um, then if a particular situation comes up and we need to list all of them, we will know that we've had all of them, right? We, could, we can check our program against 
this other, this other known fact. On the other hand, uh, if we're not completely convinced in the formula yet, uh, and we're not completely convinced in our program, if they both give the same answers, maybe that's some evidence that we've and maybe both are okay. Again, not completely because we created both of them, right? So we may have made the same kind of logic error in both cases and, and miscounted in the same way. Um, but because the thought process here is pretty different than the thought process in other, in other ways, um, if you come up with the same answer both ways, it gives some kind of indication that maybe we're, maybe we're okay. All right, but if we can prove the mathematical part and then our program matches that, then we know for sure that the program is giving the right results. Okay, so um, let's write down the numbers that we had again. Um, I'm going to write n this way. And we didn't have a, a Notation. I don't think we wrote down a notation that we were using for the number of derangements. Uh, we said that sometimes you see it written like that because it's a permutation that's out of order. Uh, that. What if we just say something like a function d of n, the number of derangements with n items, or whatever you want to call it, right? Call your function whatever you like. Um, so. So we had these values that we created, or checked, right? We, these we did manually, basically. This one, um, if you did it by, by program or listing everything, it's, it is possible. How many, how many permutations of five items are there? There's only 120. Right? We, could, we could do this by hand um, and, and get that value and check it. Go on out to six items. Did anybody find the answer for six without, say, the mathematical technique with a, with a program? Yeah, two, six, five. Okay, and so you did this approach of creating the permutations? Yeah. Okay. And so got 265. This is basically a physical counting of all of the of all of the of, uh, of all of the derangements right by listing things checking is this a derangement yes or no 265 of them okay so uh, a couple of people um, were looking at these numbers and noticed a pattern you notice that when you're looking at a particular n If you multiply by the previous value of the number of derangements, so you multiply here, and then either add or subtract 1. So multiply here, and then add or subtract 1. Multiply here, then add or subtract 1. And so what was it looking like? It was looking from the data like d of n, right? So the number of derangements of n items looks like n times the number of derangements of n minus 1 things, and then plus or minus 1 depending on something. So just based on a little bit of part of a table, right? This this much data, uh, this idea was, or this pattern was noticed by a couple of people. 
So is it plus one or minus one in the in the data that we have so far? Now we have no reason to believe that this continues beyond this point, right? They they got to about here and saw started looking in the in the numbers, trying to find some kind of pattern to it. And this pattern could very well end right here. But so far, looking at it, is it when is it plus one and when is it minus one? So here, the value was a, was minus one. What happened here? It's plus one. Then there was minus one again. Then it was plus one. Then minus one. Then plus one. When does it look like when does it look like we're adding one? When n is even and we're subtracting one when n is odd. So what could we do over here instead of saying plus or minus one? What can we do? We could say plus minus 1 to what power? To the nth power. And so then what would happen? When n is odd, that would be a negative number. And when n is even, that would be a positive number. And so if this pattern continues, we have a nice little formula for calculating the number of derangements. If this pattern doesn't continue, then we just have a formula that works for the first five or six numbers, right? And so we don't have any more confidence in this pattern than we do in a program that we wrote that we haven't been able to check yet. Right? Just, oh, well, look, it matches so far. So what could be wrong? Well, what could be wrong is these numbers could potentially be wrong. But we know these are OK because we manually listed all of those, and we looked at all of them, and we checked them individually. This one, how many permutations are there of six items? 720. 720. We could still do that by hand, right? We could still list all of them and check those. Um, when we have 10 people. We could give each of them a subset of the permutations to create, right? Some kind of rules. Maybe make sure that you're creating different permutations. Um, and kind of spread that out. And so anyway, what happens? This is a potential. This is a guess just based on some data, this limited amount of data. Um, it would be nice if it were if it were true. Because what could we do? We have this recursive aspect, but we know some values. Right, so we have a base case, right? We have a situation where the recursion eventually stops. What's the downside to this? If you put in n equals 10,000, we have to calculate all of those values all the way back, right? And so if we're doing that in, in directly, um, then this could still be difficult to calculate for large values of n. Okay, excuse me. <clears throat> so this is a first uh, potential kind of shortcut to the calculation, right? By calculating the number of, of derangements without actually having to create all of the derangements. To use it, though, what do we have to do? But before we can really use it, we have to prove it, right? We have to be able to confirm that it's an actual valid formula. And so what do you think, uh, what approach, if you were going to try to prove this, what kind of approach, what, what technique do you think that we would need to use? It'd probably be an induction proof because the idea is you're trying to prove something for all positive integers. Mm 
So if it's true for one, then somehow figure out how, why it's true for the next one. Um, why are we multiplying these values? And then why are we sometimes adding one and sometimes subtracting one? Well, we would have to try to figure out why that is working, right? So, um, so maybe we can prove this and maybe we can't based on, what, based on the tools that we have available right now. But it seems like the structure of something that would be an inductive argument, it's true for this value, why would it be true for the next one? If we could figure out why that would be true for the next situation and why you're adding one sometimes and subtracting one at other times, then that would, uh, that would be the inductive argument of why this formula always works. And then that would be a valid formula that we could then use. There might be a different approach. There might be some other approach that's not induction uh, based on the idea of a derangement being no fixed points. Maybe there's some idea, some other idea that we could utilize there. Okay, but this was strictly based on some people looking at the data and saying, I think I see a pattern. So if that pattern were to continue, what should the next number be? Next number, when we do the multiplication, and then what are we going to do? Subtract, Subtract one, 1,854. Did anybody use this approach and get that value? Yes. So using the approach of listing all possible permutations, that is the number we get. What does that do? Does that mean our formula is correct? No, it just means that it works for another value. There is, I, I think I mentioned once before, there is a um, particular problem that all the answers work until you, the, the particular pattern that they're talking about, everything works. Every number that you try, every pair of numbers it turns out that you try, works until you get to something, I forget, the, the first number that breaks it has something like a thousand digits or something. So it works for every number up until a certain point, and then the formula doesn't work anymore. I forget how big it is. I'll, I'll have to look this up. Like um, n in the thousand? I'm sorry? Like n in the thousand? Or I think our n would be a thousand? Well, it, n would have like a thousand digits. Oh, okay. So n is a really, really, was a, would be a really, really big number. And so not, now not this situation, right? Not, not this formula. But in this other problem, oh. um, in this other problem, the, the pattern that seems to hold works until you get to this really, really, really big pair of numbers, and then all of a sudden the pattern breaks. And so just because we find a pattern that works for seven numbers or 10 numbers or 50 numbers doesn't guarantee that that pattern is going to continue after that. So, um, but so far, the next value works out. So what we'll, what we'll do is we'll come back to this uh, and see if we can come up with some, some argument for why it might be true. Okay, so this then is a second potential approach. Positive points about it? Well, it matches our data. Negative points about it? Why would that have anything to do with counting derangements? Right? Why is it plus or minus one? What, 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 what's going on there? Okay, so if we can do this, it will work for small enough values of n. If this is true, it will work for small enough values of n, right? because we have to be able to calculate this. Okay, let's try our third approach then. You mentioned that you tried inclusion exclusion. All right, so let's see here. With inclusion exclusion, 
the idea. We would want to start with all possible permutations, throw away certain things. If we've thrown away too many, we have to add some things back in, throw away other things, add some things back in, back and forth, back and forth. All right, so let's consider the first step there. Let's take all possible permutations. How many of those are there? N factorial. There are n factorial of those. Now let's consider all the permutations that have one element fixed. How many permutations have one element fixed? Now, not just one, right? But at least one. So how many have at least one element fixed? Well, let's pick one of the elements, fix it, and then permute everything else. And not worry about the everything else, whether the everything else was is a derangement or not. Right? We just care that that one element is in is in its right spot. Again, not a right spot for a derangement, but in its right spot for right, the permutation in terms of the in terms of the original order. All right. So, how many permutations have one element fixed? Well, how many elements could we pick to be the one that we're focusing on? Mm -hmm. N, right? So, of the n elements, we're going to pick one and say, let's make sure that one's where it was originally. And then what are we going to do? Then we will permute everything else. Does that make sense? What is this? This is permutations that have one element fixed. So what do we want to do? We want to take those out. We don't want the number of permutations to include these things that have a fixed element. So as our partial step right now, what have we done? We start with all the permutations and we take out the ones that have one thing in the right spot. Does that make sense? So what have we done? We've started with all permutations and thrown away some of the things that are not derangements. But when we throw away some of the things that are not derangements, what have we done? We've also thrown away things that have two values in the right spot. How many times did we throw those away? Let's say we were looking at spot I and, and spot J. Right? So position I, position J, whatever they happen to be. We threw away the, the permutation that had value I in position I. But then we also threw away that same permutation later when we were looking at the J. Does that make sense? So we had something, we have, we have a permutation, we have whatever here, then I is here, and then you have J, and then whatever. So when we picked I to focus on, we threw away this permutation. But then later, when we were focusing on J, this same permutation would have come up and we threw it away there as well. So what did we do? This one permutation, we threw away twice. We threw it away when we were focusing on I, 
and then later we threw it away when we were focusing on, on J. So what do we have to do? We're going to have to add that back in. Because we've thrown those away twice. We can't throw them away twice. We want to end up throwing them out one time. So what do we have to do? We're going to have to add back in the permutations with two elements fixed. Well, what does two uh, what, did, what, what happens with two elements being fixed? Taking two elements and then doing what with the other values? Permuting, Permuting those values. Hmm. Yeah. So how many ways are there to permute the other values? N minus two. N minus two factorial. So with A, we looked at all possible permutations. With B, we're looking at the one element being fixed. C was two elements, and then we'll go on and on and on, right? The three elements, four elements. What happens? When we add those back in, we added too many things back in. We added some things back in, so what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to subtract the situation where three things are all in the right spot. What's going to happen? We will keep going until we get to the end. And we will either add or subtract the situation where everything was in the right spot. And it's going to depend on n whether you add or subtract at that point, right? And so what will happen? Um, at the end, we'll choose n, and then this is like the pattern we had before. You either add one or subtract one. Yeah. So this is the inclusion exclusion. You either add. Oh well, no, it's not the add one or subtract one. But yes, because, right? Because, because that's one and that's one. Depending on your n. So you were talking you about can, this yeah, pattern. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, so what's this pattern? Now we see a reason for the plus or minus one. The plus or minus one potentially could come from, from right there, because that's going to be either plus one or minus one. So now suddenly adding or subtracting one doesn't seem quite so strange. Okay, so what happens? Inclusion exclusion gives us this formula for the number of derangements. What have we done? We've started with all possible permutations, thrown away the things that have one element in the right spot, and then said, wait a minute, we threw away too many things. Let's add back the things that had two elements in the right spot so that we've got the right count. Oh, wait a minute, let's throw away the things with three because we've, we've added those back in too many times. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And what have we ended up doing? We end up getting rid of all of the things that have any elements in the right spot. But this is a messy looking formula. So let's see if we can, can simplify it a little bit. All of these pieces in there look similar. Right? So let's look at one of these pieces. Let's look at n choose i times n minus i factorial because all of those are in there somewhere, right? Let's simplify that. What is n choose i? n choose i is n factorial over is it i factorial times n minus i factorial? Right? n factorial over i factorial times n minus i factorial. Then times n minus i factorial. So what happens? That reduces, doesn't it? And so what are all of these pieces? All of these pieces are really 
n factorial over i factorial. So what does that do to our formula? It's going to simplify our formula. n factorial minus what? That would be n factorial over 1 factorial plus n factorial over 2 factorial minus n factorial over 3 factorial and so on until we get to where? The last thing look like that. Is this a formula that, that we could calculate? Mm -hmm. All right, again, as long as n doesn't get too big because n factorial gets big, but we can handle pretty big numbers, right? So can we simplify this a little bit? There's an n factorial in all those pieces, right? So we could factor that out and only calculate n factorial one time. Yeah, take that one minus. One minus one over one factorial plus one over two factorial uh, minus. My beneficial, right? Not having to calculate n factorial so many times. Okay. So we can see some simplification here. 1 minus 1 over 1 factorial is what? That's 0. So it's really 1 over 2 factorial minus 1 over 3 factorial and so on. Um, but we'll just keep it in place in place for now. All right, so is this formula correct? Yes. How do we know that it's correct? Well, we just marked it. Well, we, we trust inclusion exclusion, right? We know that that approach works, and we just applied the approach. Add things, subtract them back off. Add things, subtract things back off, right? Back and forth, back and forth. Overcount, then undercount, then overcount, then undercount, until you get down to the end of that process and we have the correct count at the end. All right, so this formula is still a little bit messy because there's a lot of pieces involved in that. So let's see what we can do about simplifying that a little bit. So our formula right now What was that? Oh. You use this approach, but not quite. Yeah. Not quite like this. So you, you have a formula at the end, but it's maybe not quite so. Um, I didn't actually write it out. I could write it out, but it's sort of recursive. Okay. So maybe a mix between 
see what happens when we when we push this method all the way to its to its end then see see what'll happen this part right here this one doesn't seem to fit in with the rest of those patterns but what were we doing with that one that one how many things were we uh, focusing on to 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 guarantee were fixed we weren't focusing on anything to guarantee that it was fixed right so really this part right here we could think of it as 1 over 0 factorial because we weren't focusing on any of those as a thing to we didn't say any of them had to be in a, in a fixed position as a matter of fact we wanted the ones that aren't in a fixed position to be part of the total because those are the things that we ultimately want to include in our final answer. Does that make sense? So even though that part looked different in, in terms of the expansion, it really is, is the same pattern. All right, so what can we do for simplifying the formula? Well, what's happening in there is we really have a summation where k is starting at 0 and going to n, where k is some, uh, some counter. And what are the pieces? The pieces are negative 1 to the k power over k factorial. And so this is the same formula, just written in a more concise way, but it doesn't help us any in terms of calculating it, because how do you calculate that? You calculate that by doing all of these pieces. All right, so that doesn't help anything. It just fits on the page a little bit better. It doesn't help us calculate the numbers. So let's look at this. Have we ever seen anything that looks even remotely like that? In calculus, right? In Calc 2, this was the, the idea of a, of a series. Except there was no n, it was infinity, infinity right? We would have an infinite, an infinite series. And usually in those, um, we might start at, you know, we might start at 1, but sometimes we started at 0 for different situations. But we had infinite series there rather than finite uh, series. So this, this stops. But what happens if n's, as, as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what happens? This gets closer and closer and closer to whatever happened uh, with infinity, so long as the series converges. All right. You saw a particular series at one point. You saw series expansion for e to the x, and I'm sure you all have it right on the tip of your tongue. You know exactly uh, what that series expansion was. That series expansion looks like this. That looks very similar to what we have right here. Not quite. What's different? This has an x, and that has an x. And there aren't any x's here. But what, and that goes to infinity rather than stopping at n. What x could we put in here to make this look more like that? x equals negative 1. Right, so e to the negative 1, or 1 over e, is is that. Well, that's not quite what we have right here. But if n gets big, it's awfully close. If n doesn't get big, it's pretty close as well. So what does this mean? This means 
that the number of derangements is not equal to, but awfully close to n factorial times e to the negative 1 power, or n factorial divided by e. Can you calculate that pretty quickly? Yeah, we, we, because we have to calculate n factorial anyway, and then divide by e. To me, I think this is the coolest result of everything that I've ever seen. Because what are we doing? We're counting finite things, discrete things, separate things. And what comes into play? The natural number e. Why would it have any connection at all to this? It's amazing to me. Right? Things from calculus and things that are definitely not calculus connecting in that way. Right? The continuous and the discrete, that's, that's, that's super cool to me. Um, all right, so what happens? Inclusion, exclusion gives us this, which we can work with, but then calculus says, you know, let me, let me chip in here a little bit. It gives us this. But it's not exactly that, right? It's just approximately that. Turns out that we can tell exactly what happens. How close is it? It turns out to be you calculate n factorial divided by e, and then you just go to the nearest integer. You, you round down if it was less than something 0.5, and you round up if it was greater than that. And so a condensed version of all of this becomes d of n, right? the number of derangements of n items, is n factorial divided by e. But then we have to figure out which way to round. So what would you do if you want to, to make sure that we're rounding in the correct way? Right? You have to round down sometimes or round up, um, depending on where we are. We can get the rounding by adding 1 half to that. And then you've seen the floor function before, the floor. This turns out to always round up when you need to and round down when you need to um, in, the, uh, in the appropriate way. So what happens here? If this number is something 0.4, what happens when you add a half to it? It's 0.9, and then you just knock that part off, so that rounds it down. What if this were something 0.6? Then it'll go, it would be kind of like plus 1.1. And when you round that down, that gives the round up from the original, from the original position. All right, so if you had, here's, here's the 0.5. If you are on this side, you add a half that takes you to this side, and then you round it down to that integer. If you were on this side, that pushes you past, but then you round down to that integer. All right, so what happens as far as the what happens as far as the formula goes for calculating derangements? We can jump straight to there. It's not list all of the derangements or list all the permutations and check which ones are, are derangements. It's not even this formula. It's based on, on the data. We have this approach. Now there's another approach, too, that we can do. Maybe we should have done it first. Um, a, a third way, mathematically, to solve this. This one, we know is true. So how do they prove that it's only close enough to round to the correct answer? And we know about doing that. So that involves looking at the error terms in this expansion. So if you remember mm -hmm. in calculus, there was a situation of how, what is the error term? How big is the error term relative to the actual value? Mm 
And so how big is the error term relative to the actual value is, is what we have to go into. So there's more uh, in terms of making, making that an equal sign. Mm -hmm. But this comes just from inclusion and exclusion and, and this expansion. The fact that it's actually equal comes in looking at that error term and seeing how close it always is. And, and it turns out that that error term gets smaller and smaller, and so it does always come within, within the approach. If you want to see those details, we can talk about that a little bit more separately. I think this is kind of overwhelming enough for the rest of for, for everyone else. Um, but you see, the, you see the idea that inclusion, exclusion, it's in the examples that we were looking at before, is we almost could have done it without using those approaches. But here, we don't really have a good way to keep track of everything, but inclusion exclusion organizes it for us. And even if we don't come all the way to here, this, this is still a little bit easier to, to program. And we get our answers a lot faster than necessarily listing all the per, uh, permutations and throwing out the bad ones and keeping the good ones. And again, bad is good, whatever, right? The ones we want versus the ones that we don't want. Okay, so sort of makes sense. Let's look at a completely different way. So we have to number four, I guess now, right? Five, no, five, whatever, four or five. Um, Look at another way to count derangements. We have all of the items, what how many ever there are, and whatever is going on. So I'm just going to index these one, two, three, so on. Over here is index i. This person who's first in a derangement, I was thinking of it as a person because we talked about the example of, um, of someone getting their homework back, right? The right homework. Or just think about of, of that value, right? The thing that's supposed to be first. Well, the thing that's supposed to be first won't be won't be the right value in a derangement. So thinking of, of people getting the wrong homework back, this person, person one, Well, person one will get some value. And so person one gets someone else's homework because we're talking about a derangement. Nobody got back their own homework. So let's say that person one, there, there are two possibilities. Let's say person one gets homework I. At this point, there are two possibilities. Person I could get person one's homework or someone else's. Does that make sense? I mean, Person one gets someone's. That person could have gotten person one's or could have gotten someone else's. There are two possibilities. So we have person one got person I's homework. Two possibilities. <clears throat> 
ones or person I get person J's. So we're assuming that person one is going to get their own. Person one is not going to get their own because it's a derangement. Okay. We're counting derangements. Okay. All right. So nobody gets their own. So person one will not get their own. Person one gets somebody else's. Gotcha. And that's a guarantee. Person one gets somebody else's. Now we're going to look at that person and say what could happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if person I gets person one's, then what happens? Those two values are out of play. Right? One and I, we already know where they are. So how many derangements are there? Well, everyone else has to be getting the wrong values. So how many derangements? In this case, the number of derangements is we derange the other n minus two things. Does that make sense? So those two are not fixed points, but they're settled, they're established, we know who got what. And then the other things, even if person I, uh, one gets uh, person I's homework and person I gets person one's homework, there are still this many ways for everyone else to get their homework. Does that make sense? All right. What if person I get some other person's homework? Yeah. Then there are this many ways, because person J could be a bunch of different people. So in that case, there are this many different derangements. Everybody else is is messed up, right? Their homework is all messed up. Does it make sense? Okay, so once this person gets person I's homework, there are, depending on what else happened, there are this many or this many derangements. How many different people could person one get? How many values could I be? N minus one, right? So the number of permutations is going to be, how many choices do we have for I? There are N minus one choices for I. And then what happens? Once you've made that choice, there are this many things that can happen if person I didn't get person one's homework. And separately, there are this many things that can happen if person I did get person one's homework. Make sense? So these are two separate categories. That's why we have addition between them. In one category, this is where person one gets someone's homework and that person doesn't get person one's homework. So this many things can happen there. Wow. In the other situation, person one got person I's homework, and person I got person one's homework. So those two swapped, and then everybody else, their homework is all jumbled up. So what happens? N becomes N minus one times 
and there is another formula for counting the arrangements. Why are we tying them together if only one of them is going to happen? I'm sorry? If, if only one of them can happen, why are we adding them together? Well, because what's going to happen, we have to count all possible things that could happen. And so it's going to be one or the other in a particular situation, but what could happen, either could happen. So you count all the ways that one thing could happen, and then you count all the ways the other thing could happen. But it's only going to be one category in a particular situation. But what could happen, it could be from this category, or it could be from that category. And that's where the, the adding part comes in. How do you know you haven't overcounted that? Yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't it? I feel like if only one situation really is going to happen, depending on the case, and then you add both cases together, when that, how would that not overcount? So, So let's think about what we talked about with pizza. With pizza, we were talking about, uh, say, up to three toppings. When we were talking about up to three toppings, we said, okay, well, you have to account for the possibility of zero toppings. We have to account for the possibility of one topping, account for the possibility of two, and account for the possibility of three. And then what did we do? Added those together because if you happen to order no toppings, there was one way to do that. If you happen to order a one topping pizza, there were, in this situation, maybe, maybe if there's three toppings available, maybe there are three ways to do that. If you happen to do this or you happen to do that, well, we set up to that, so all of those categories, only one of them is going to happen when you go order your pizza. But what could happen? Okay. All those different things could happen, so when we say what can happen, we have to count all things that can happen. So this count is coming before any of them have actually happened. Now, what's going to happen when you pass out the papers? If it happens to be a derangement, it's going to be one of these. It'll either be one of this category or one of that category. But there are lots of things that could happen. Yeah. But when it does happen, one of them is what actually occurs. All right? Definitely better. What, what I'm kind of confusing on is the, like, the remaining n factorial, like the, the factorial after those two, say those two got their paper swapped or they have a different, or the second guy, if one of those two cases happens, the remainder that is the factorial, the rest, the rest of the choices, how do you know that they have different papers? We don't, well, so, I mean, the idea here is we're counting derangements. So we're saying, we're counting the situations when they do have different papers. Right, so what are we looking at? We're saying, we're trying to count the situations where everyone does get a different paper. So that's our assumption going in. Everyone's getting a different paper. But to count these, we focus just on person one, and then the person whose paper person one got. Everyone else, we just know that something different happened. Their papers are all jumbled up. But those two are the two that we focus on in order to organize the count, to make sure that we've counted everything exactly once. So what do we do? If person I, the other person, gets person one's paper, then we know this, is, this situation has happened. Person one got I's paper, person I got one's paper. And then what happens with everybody else? All the other n minus two people, their papers are all jumbled up. Well, how many ways are their papers to be jumbled up? Their papers can be jumbled up that many ways. Even once we set those two in place, there's lots of ways we could mess everything else up. How many ways are there to mess everything else up? Well, there are n minus two people now. So there are this many ways to mess it up. What happens if person I does not get person one's paper, 
now there are n minus one people, and there are even more ways to mess that up than there were here. So we have a whole bunch of ways to mess up everyone else's papers, right? n minus one people in that case. So if we're going into this situation knowing that everything is going to be derangements, doesn't that kind of defeat the purpose? No, we're that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to count the derangements. Now, what happens? This number is going to be less than n factorial. I mean, the, the number of derangements for n, right, is less than n factorial. Because what happens? Lots of times, we're going to give back papers, and in, in, in good situations, everyone gets their own paper. Right? In the right situation, everyone gets their own. Definitely not a derangement. Mm -hmm. So what we're counting here is we're saying, what can go wrong? How many ways are there for things to go wrong in terms of people getting their stuff back? And when we say going wrong, we're talking about going completely wrong. Right? Nobody gets the right thing back. And so we're focusing on counting those things with these formulas because those are the things that we want to count, where everything went wrong. What will happen uh, in permutations? In permutations, there are situations where exactly one... Well, can, can you have exactly one thing being wrong? Can you have everyone gets their, their right paper back except one person gets the wrong paper? No, someone's absent. Not All right, so if someone was absent, then... But then you still have two people. Well, if some, not everyone gets the paper back then, right? The wrong person, someone who wasn't there, gets a paper back, but the person who was there doesn't get one back. Um, but that's kind of getting the wrong paper, right? You get, the, you get the zero when you should. So so can you have just one person being out of order? No, you have to have at least two. Can you have three being out of order? What happens if you just shift around by one, right? You have three people and you shift around by one. So three people can get the wrong, um, can get the wrong papers. And then, four, and then anything bigger than that, right? But you can't have just one person getting the wrong paper back. Um, but everyone else, uh, but, but any other possibility exists. So what are we counting here with derangements? We're saying we're, we're focusing on this bad situation of nobody getting the right thing. Except is it a bad situation? Let's think about what happens in terms of, uh, I don't know, there's some, some organizations have like secret, around Christmas time or something, right? Secret Santa or other situations where you have like secret gift giving. What do you want to have happen in that situation? You don't want to have to buy your own gift. So everyone needs to buy a gift for someone else. How many ways are there to buy a gift for someone else? How many derangements are there? Right? How many ways? Not how many ways are there to buy a gift for someone else? How many ways are there to organize it with you buying for somebody else and everyone, everyone buying for someone else? How many ways are there to do that? There are a lot of ways to do that. There are also a lot of ways to not do that. Right? Because permutations where something is fixed is not what we want in this case. Yeah, so what would happen if, yeah, we're going to grade each other's papers, which used to be a thing, but it's like not, I don't, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think they're allowed to do that in schools anymore, are they? Um, and so, so what happens if you, you want to make sure that somebody else, well, you don't want to make sure somebody else is, you want to grade your own so you can give yourself a perfect score, but the teacher wants everyone to grade someone else's. And so what do you have to make sure? You have to make sure that you have a derangement. Can you always do it? As long as you have enough people, and how many people do you need? You need at least two. Once you have two people, there is a derangement, at least one derangement possible. And the more people you have, the more are possible. But you still have to be careful, because a lot of ways of passing around things wouldn't necessarily end up uh, with, with everyone getting someone else's. Uh, for it to be secret Santa, though, wouldn't it need to be 
Because if it's you and another person, <laughs> well, we had switched gears now to the um, to the grading someone else's paper. Um, <laughs> yeah, if you have two people and you're like, okay, let's keep a secret, let's buy a gift for someone. Yeah, okay. Um, and then one of them buys for themselves, right? So, uh, so yes, uh, in that case, you would need more than more than two people. But the derangement part of it would still would still hold. Does this sort of make sense? So what happens? We have the calculation method, the computation method, write a program. We have some potential problems with writing a program because of how do we make sure that we've gotten all the permutations, every single possible permutation. We have to think about that a little bit maybe. But once we have that, we can check to see, is this permutation a derangement or not? We also have to make sure that we haven't duplicated and had the same permutation multiple times or the same derangement multiple times. Uh, but that's part of that, part of that procedure. Mathematically, then we have at least three different ways. This approach, you still might have to think about it and see whether you, whether you trust what's happening here. But this gives us a formula, a formula that is based on recursion, so again, we're going to have limitations when n gets too big. We have a formula that is based from uh, inclusion-exclusion that is a straightforward single calculation. Again, when n gets too big, uh, we have floating point things dividing by e and so on. But anyway, um, the idea there is that this is a straightforward calculation. And we have this formula that looks valid based on some data, but we still would need to try to figure out why that is true. But we now do at least see some reason for the plus or minus one at the end. There's a connection. We can think about what's happening here and see if we can maybe revise this solution or this solution into that other format. All right, so at least four different ways, conceivably, to consider the answer to, to, the, to the situation. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to...